Welcome everyone to the Stateless Atheist. Today I'm interviewing Jared Ballou uh, about uh, his experiences in the military, uh, his political views, and how the two relate to one another. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. Welcome, Jared. Um, for starters, how long were you in the military for? I was uh, three years active duty and then uh, about 18 months in the National Guard. Okay. Uh, what state? Massachusetts. Okay. I was in the Army National Guard, um, New York, for nine years. Oh, cool. uh, what was your uh, MOS? Uh, when I enlisted, it was 31U. I think it's 25U now, basically like radio guy. I was a 31 uniform myself. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know they changed it though. Cause yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's funny. Cause, um, when I, my last deployment in the guard, um, they also reclassed all the engineers from 12 to 21. Um, and because I was in an engineer unit, they actually listed me as a 21U, which is like topographic system at like it's a surveyor, I think. Um, so my DD-214 actually says that I'm a surveyor now instead of a radio guy. <laughs> it's funny because when I joined, I chose 31 uniform because I thought it was going to be a lot more technical yeah. than what it actually was. It was, but it ended up being, this radio's broke, swap it out. Like, yeah, some 11 Bravo just went over and, like, hit the clear on the Singars. You're like, I can't talk to anyone on the radio now, guys. I'm like, I wanted to actually repair radios, but no. Yeah. Um. Yeah, okay. that's pretty cool because like when I like um because I, I enlisted before 9-11 uh, my actual my original basic training ship date was September 12th 2001 which obviously couldn't go um and so like when I got there it was like originally like you know I had enlisted and I was going to go to Korea um but then while we were in uh AIT we were like the second or third class to go through after you know we'd done the invasion of Afghanistan um and they were having problems with FM so they were like hey we want to send two people down to um to Harris in Tampa um, and basically learn how to use these new satellite radios, you know, figure out how to order the parts for them and basically like set us up as kind of like almost like in military, you know, like dealer vendor kind of liaisons for them. Um, and we were like, eh, I don't know. And they're like, well, we'll give you $20,000 bonus and you get to go to airborne school. And we're like, all right. Yeah. So like me and five guys went down there um, and just did like a whole bunch of stuff on like the new PSN, like the man portable satellite stuff. So um, I got to do a lot more technical stuff than most 31 U's got to. So um and then when I went to Iraq, I ended up creating um, like a ISP for our base and ended up being like the third largest privately held network in the country. It turned into Magic Island Internet. So I don't know if you know anyone who went to Iraq, but if they used Magic Island um, from like 2005 to 2008, it was all like almost completely built by me and another guy. <laughs> I was lucky because um, my ETS was around the same time my unit was about to go to Iraq. Yeah. And they didn't institute a stop loss yet. They instituted the stop loss the day after my ETS. Oh, that sucks. And they were able to pull you back in because of IRR or something? No, so I never went. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I actually, um, so after, you know, I did that, um, I went over um, with, I ended up getting, I was with a 35th SIG originally, then got attached to 82nd to a brigade headquarters, did a deployment. Um, and then the guy who came to replace me from 10th Mountain, the second day he was there, stepped on a landmine and the only guy there that knew how to do it. Um, so I ended up staying on for another like six months with them. Um, so when I got done with my three year obligation, um, I got out and like everyone who had gone down and taken that specialized training was getting yanked in IRR and being sent to 18th Airborne Brigade and like being basically stuffed in a box for a year and a half in Iraq. Um, so I was like, well, I can either wait until I get picked for a unit like that, or I can roll the dice. And the guard had a thing called try for one, where you just literally you listen for one year and it cleared your IRR. Cause I had a three year uh, obligation. I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll throw the dice. And so I joined up, uh, joined a unit. And then like, I don't know, a month or two after I joined, they were like, Hey, we got orders for a rock. We're going to Abu Ghraib. <laughs> so I was like, eh, all right. So while you were there, while you're in, what's the worst experience you had? Um, I would say probably, um, so, um, I was like, because I was really like a nerdy guy, like, you know, I was in like, okay shape, but like, I really like had a big chip on my shoulder to prove something. Um, so I would like, basically it was like a glory hunt. Like I signed up and went out on every mission. I was on medical missions all the time. Like anytime I got outside the wire, I was doing it. Um, and so I ended up on a, um, a battle damage assessment slash, you know, casually clearing, uh, operation at our brigade. 
Um, and we had, um, in outside of Gardez, there was this little village and, uh, basically, um, uh, this kid had stepped on a landmine, had been evacuated, uh, came back to the hospital and died while he was there. Um, it was a seven year old kid. And then we brought him back, um, to his family. And we, you know, we basically, you know, the way that we normally do it is, you know, we, we go to the village elder and we're like, you know, Hey, we have a body. We're here from ITAR or ISAF. And, you know, we you know, have someone that, you know, lives here in the village. And so they would go and like get the person and we basically transfer the remains. And, uh, when we, you know, when we showed him, you know, the body, uh, the village elder was actually the grandfather. And so he just like froze up and was like, you know, just, you could just see it on his face. Uh, and then he called the father over, um, and the dad came over and like, um, did you go to Afghanistan or Iraq? You didn't. Oh, I never deployed. I was knocked okay. out. Um, but yeah, like, especially in Afghanistan, like the people are very non-expressive. Like their culture is really like at certain times, like when they're celebrating, like they'll rip it up. But like, other than that, they're very even tempered. And it's like, you know, kind of like that, you know, stoic mountain guy kind of, you know, attitude. Um, but the dad came over and like, you know, he was, you know, he, you know, he was like a Mujahideen guy who had, you know, like been fighting, you know, the Russians and stuff before. So like, he was a tough dude. Um, and he just came over and like, when he saw his son, he just, he made this noise and the noise of it is what sticks with me the most. Just like, it sounded like an animal, like, like it didn't even sound like a person, but just like the saddest, like most heartbreaking thing that I have ever heard in my life, bar none was that guy like just realizing what had happened and just like there was so much of that while I was there because like I didn't see a whole lot of action um you know I was in a headquarters unit so I spent most of my time you know basically sitting around a desk um but I did because of the fact that I was always volunteering on, on missions and stuff like I was out like I was on a mine clearing mission I was out like you know helping out with like you know like local you know handing out like medical aid and stuff like that so I, I got to see a lot of the kind of like the human cost of what we did over there. Um, and that really is, you know, like what has stuck with me the most from that. Do you think that the military does any good or bad or what? it's it's it, I mean, it depends on who you are. Um, I think for a lot of Americans, it's not really beneficial for them, even though like, you know, like people think they're like, oh, thank you for your service. And I'm like, I watched war crimes that you paid for in real time, you know, like, and it's like, not to be glib, but like, that's really what I did, you know, like, like almost nothing. Well, my first tour when we were in Afghanistan, like we, we basically won the war in 2003 there, you know, like we had really great relationships with, with the local uh, population. We were, you know, like, I can't tell you how many times that we would go out and like, you know, help set up schools, help get water filtration going, help these guys, you know, we were really partners for the people that were there. And like, I felt really good about that work. And that was like, you know, I enlisted, you know, I really didn't care about going to college. I didn't need money. I came from an upper middle class house. I just thought that, you know, I should do something to help the world and my country. So I really felt like I was doing it there. Um, my second tour, I didn't really see it as much. I saw a lot more like kind of like the bureaucracy, but then my tour in Iraq basically fucking shook my faith in the fact that the military, you know, like everything from detainee abuse to um, there was a rape in my unit that the sergeant major refused to investigate. Uh, he bullied one of the soldiers to the point where the soldier killed himself. Um, refute the, uh, the, uh, what the victims. What one of the victims c killed themselves? I'm guessing. Yeah, no, it was it was a guy who, um, you know, I mean, he had I think he had some other stuff going on, but like he was like having a really hard time and like he kept going to combat stress and was like, you know, really having a bad time of it. And rather than being like, you know, like, you know, I came from 82nd airborne and I was also in special forces units. So like, you know, liaison with these guys, like I'm not an SF guy, but like I've seen hard people and like, they are very, you know, like you're hard when you need to be, but then when you come back, you take care of your people, you know, but yeah. like these like national guard and reservist types that, that I experienced were like, I think they, they were trying to prove something like they were tougher than they were. They were like always referring to each other by their ranks and stuff. And um, like really just like not, not being kind to their troops in particular. Um, and just the Sergeant major was just like not having, he was like, Oh yeah, this guy's going, you know, he's fucking just trying to shirk work and stuff. Um, and he ended up fucking shooting himself in the head while we were there. Um, and nobody wanted to hold him accountable. So I actually went to Camp Victory uh, to the, basically the IG of, you know, our entire fucking operation um, and was like, you know, I want to make a complaint about the leadership in this unit, you know, like all these things are happening, nobody's doing anything. And it got fucking swept under the rug. And so then I was just like, you know, like 
if we're not doing good for the people of this country, you know, that might be a policy issue. There could be something wrong. But when you're not doing right by the people who signed up to put their lives on the line to do a, a job that needs to be done, and you can't even have the fucking common courtesy to like take care of them when they need help, like, you know, that just, it broke my faith in the military as an institution. So I think there's a lot of good people in it and there's a lot of good individual missions and actions that it does. But I think overall it's a fucking cesspool. It's, that seems similar to my view of the, both the military and even the police and the government as a whole. While I'm against the government as an anarchist, I do think there's a lot of people that want to do good things. I just think they're going about it wrong. Well, it's the, the problem is, is that, you know, like, um, like I didn't really do anything that I'm really ashamed of. Like I, I did, um, while I was doing a work detail, um, there was a guy who was just being a pain in the ass and, um, I hit him in the face with my rifle to shut him up because he actually grabbed one of the other guy's rifles there. Cause like we had this whole thing, he wasn't working. Um, and I knew he wasn't a threat, but I just hit him anyway. Um, but that's like the worst thing that I've done. Um, but there's like. Um, I just totally lost my train of thought there. What was I saying? Uh, You're talking about like uh, whether or not you are ashamed of anything you did. Oh yeah, but I think you know just because I was there and like you know like I always tried to you know I never got a good conduct medal and I got court martialed in like three or four Article 15s, but all of them were for like sticking up for my guys doing the right thing. Like you cannot trust a man with a good conduct medal because in the military you're going to have those situations where that happens and what happens is is that when the regulations tell you like you know that you have to do this a certain way you do that a lot of people like in a system will take the rules of the system as what they have to do not like what's the greater context what what am i actually doing here like you know i signed an oath to you know defend the country and the people and you know do this no actually my job is you know in the military this is my little part of the machine so you get really compartmentalized and even if you're a good person and you do good things like for the most part it's going to get out like evened out in the wash of like all the other shitty people that are there and in a lot of cases like what will happen is is that your sacrifice will be used as a justification for like why this thing is good like the military is good look at this guy doing all this great stuff but yeah also look at the fact that like we're basically committing crimes against humanity like for profit so you know i, I think there's a there's a danger in looking at the individuals and their intentions and, and what they try to do and, and making any sort of judgments about the system or the organization as a whole based on that like it's you know, they are two very different things and they're conflated intentionally to make us, you know, you know, that's why people thank me for my service. They're like, I love being free. Thanks for doing that. I'm like, nothing I did made you any materially freer. And most of the things that I did just put my kids and your kids in debt, you know? And so, in danger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this like everything that we ha had seen from the war on terror is a blowback for bad decisions we've made in the past. And then we keep doubling down like, well, maybe if we just blow up enough of them, they'll stop trying to blow us up. Like, you know, like, look what happened on 9-11. Like, did we say, oh, no, Osama bin Laden blew up the buildings. All right, fuck it. We give up. We're done. Thanks, dude. You were too tough. Shock and awe, you know? Like, it just, humans just don't work like that. But for some reason, after Korea and Vietnam and Grenada and Panama and every other fucking banana war that America has been in that we've gotten into and been like, yeah, we basically just went there and shot a bunch of people for no good reason, like, it still doesn't connect to people that like using that tool that you've spent all this money on as your only way to interact with the world doesn't lead to good outcomes. And just trying to do that harder is going to get you even worse. It's funny because I hear from a lot of people that, um, they don't think blowback is real. I'm like, so when Bin Laden blew up the twin towers and we went and attacked them, you know, that's blowback, right? Yeah. How is it any different? Why is it well, Why does it exist when we do it, but it's yeah. not? It doesn't exist for the, them to come and attack us. I, I think America is like we're really conditioned to think that we are exceptional and ahistoric. Like America is great; it's the best it's ever been. It will be here forever. It's the best you know things in sliced bread. Like my entire life, like I was born in 1982, and America has been a fucking shithole for my entire life. You know, like we're a fucking third world country that happens to have iPhones. You know, like people have always been struggling. In my like, I look around in my town and I see. No business is owned by people in my town. I see no 
real advancement. For, like the kids who are coming up now, like this new generation, like they're totally fucked, you know? And this like myth that like, you know, all this stuff that we're doing is like making us free and better and then America's great, you know, like it's really not. But like for some reason they think that like, because America is so great, that gives us the right to go out in the world and like, you know, basically just start wars on suspicion that maybe you got some stuff, you know, it's like, imagine like, you know, like if the police could just like pull you over and shoot you, like, I think that he had a gun in the car, like that wouldn't really, you know, pass muster. But for some reason, when you do it on a national scale, people are all for it. And so, you know, like Americans are very much like, you know, they see the world as a thing that exists to serve America, not another like bunch of just regular human beings like us that also have dreams and hopes and deserve respect. I mean, our invasion of uh, Iraq was all predicated on, we, yes, um, if, if you look into it, we did find remnants, yeah. chemical weapons, but yeah. number no. one, it was just remnants. It wasn't the chemical weapons themselves. And second no. off, it was chemical weapons that we gave them to kill the Iranians. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it, it's really telling that, you know, like when, you know, they're going into the UN and making the case for war, it's, oh, he's got a nuclear program. He's making sarin gas. He's doing this. He's doing that. Had they found one of those things, you know, okay, maybe the rest of it could be conflated. Intelligence is a hard game. You know, like I've seen it from, you know, kind of close and it is, there's a lot of room for human misunderstanding and error to, to come in there. So yeah, that can happen. But like, you know, they knew that they were lying and you know that they know that they were lying because when they found those things, they're like, Oh, here it is a smoking gun. We're like, okay. You know, it'd be like, you know, if you were like, okay, I'm going to burn down this guy's house and shoot his family because he is making machine guns and child pornography. And then you go in there and it's like, Oh, actually uh, he had like two anime DVDs and a rubber gun, you know, rubber band gun, you know, like you'd be like, that is, that is not commensurate with the risk that was actually there. You misstated that. Yeah. And also just, same thing like very right wingers uh they argue oh but all these people that are attacking us while we're there if someone well, invaded the united America. states would you freedom. defend yourself yeah no there, there's this weird thing you know like i see it and, and like i was a conservative like i was a republican like when i was a kid like i had a sticker on my toy box that said had enough vote republican and like argued with my parents who were like michael dukakis supporters in the election so like you know i used to be very conservative but like I wasn't an asshole. Well, I probably was a bit of an asshole. Um, I had some pretty bad views on like gay people and minorities and stuff that kind of came in from around me that, that I'm not so proud of. But like, you know, for the most part, like I was that way because like, you know, I, as a middle-class white kid had a pretty good upbringing, you know, things were okay. But like today it's like, you know, there's none of that, like, you know, small government kind of, you know, policy. It's just like, it seems like being an asshole has kind of taken the place of having a personality for a lot of people on the right. And like, they just don't, you know, like there's just a casual violence in the way that they see the world and the, the way that they just expect to interact with one another. And it's, it's really like, that's why I really started this whole journey of going from like a 2015 Republican, like, I don't like Donald Trump to me today being like, we should abolish and execute most police officers. <laughs> So what was your views of the war then compared to now and how, how and why did it change? Well, I think um, it's, that's kind of hard to answer because um, for a lot of, like, I'm a pretty smart person, but like, especially when I was younger and I still probably have some of this, like, I just kind of took some ideas in without really critically considering them. You know, like, like you know, oh, these Iraqis hate us because we're free. Yeah, that made sense to me because I've been like brought up in this culture that like America is so free and so great that the only way that someone would be mad at America is if they were just a super bad guy and they hated freedom and democracy and they just walked around goose stepping and burning babies, you know, like that's, that's how the world was presented as like the adversarial view of America. So like my view of the war then was like, oh, we got to go in like even Iraq. I was like, I think it's wrong like to split our strategic focus and like it, it was badly executed from fucking every level um, and it cost us a victory in Afghanistan that we then just intentionally lost slowly but like I thought that at least in Afghanistan that when we first got there that we were in the right for going in there um, but I really didn't critically consider a lot like you know like when I heard like oh the Taliban said we'll give you Osama bin Laden I was like yeah well fuck them we gotta get the Taliban anyway they're the bad guys too because the TV told me that the Taliban and Al Qaeda were basically the same thing, you know? So like in my mind they were conflated. So, um, 
you know, I won't say, it's not like I didn't have agency, but it's that I didn't have the information and I wasn't at the time, like critically evaluating what was coming in enough to have an opinion that like, you know, like now I have an opinion on it because I've basically examined it considerably. But back then it was more like, I was just primed to take the idea that this was a justified war and I'm doing a good thing and just went with it. Yeah, that's the way I was too. Uh, even though I never went over, uh, I felt the military was yeah honorable thing. And, and, and that was a real crisis for me, you know, like when I started to kind of see, like especially in, in Iraq, like because I just saw like just this casual brutality again against, you know, like detainees, you know, like this was after the whole prison photo scandal thing. But, you know, like, there were guys that were there, and, you know, like, it sucked because they were given a shitty job and minimal equipment and basically no training, you know? Like, originally, we were, like, training to be, like, a convoy security group, and then, like, the, literally at the last minute, like, a week before we got there, we were like, oh, actually, you're going to Abu Ghraib, you're going to be prison guns, go. Um, and then these guys are out there for 12 hours a day in the sweltering heat. They have to wear their body armor. They roll their sleeves up so the fucking sergeant major walks out of his air conditioning trailer and is, like, extra duty for you. So, like, these guys are pissed, and they just, they treated the people there like shit. And we saw a lot of repeat customers where the Marines would go and, like, someone shot at us from this building. Let's round up fucking 60 people and put them on a bus and send them to Abu Ghraib for a year. And then those people got out, and they're like, wow, they just imprisoned me for a year because I was near where some people were shooting in a country where they invaded and started a war. So, you know, maybe now I'm going to blow up a fucking Humvee, you know? And a lot of that happened where we directly saw the people that we processed through the pipeline there that we would send out back into the world, you know, one to six to 12 months after we took them in for basically no reason. And then they just start fucking killing Americans. And I don't blame them, you know? Like, we really didn't treat them well. <laughs> Yeah. So what are your political views now? You consider yourself an anarchist, but can you go a little deeper into your views of anarchy since, since there's so many schools? Yeah. So um, I am, I'm an ideological mess. Um, you know, I think probably the closest I come to like a general is like probably mutualism or left market anarchism, like Kevin Carson kind of, you know, like political economy side. Um, you know, I'm like a big fan of like, uh, you know, individualist anarchism more so than a lot of collective forms of it, just because I think that like, you know, I guess, you know, probably from this, from Sterner is, you know, I take the view that I'm the person who knows what's best for me and I cannot say what's best for someone else. Um, so my idea is, you know, like I figure like my ideal society is, you know, we get rid of the state, we try these ideas, we see what works and what doesn't, and people can evaluate them based on their merits. And like, I kind of like, I hate that, that so many anarchists get like tied up in like communism versus capitalism. Or this. It's like, nobody fucking knows, like, none of these things have been tried in a way that's actually going to give us meaningful information as to whether or not any of them will work. Because at the end of the day, there's always a bunch of fucking thugs with machine guns that are like, hey, if you don't follow the rules as we as we practice them and break them, we will fucking kill you, you know? So it's like, until that goes away, we can't really make any firm decision of like, this is how we're going to structure it in the future. Like, you got to just give people an organization space to try things and, you know, like the idea that like we have laws on the books in this country that have been there for 200 years without change that just aren't applicable, but we just leave them there because it's hard to get rid of. Like, that's a terrible system. Like you should always be giving people and organizations the freedom and flexibility to get better at what they do and to bring more value to the people who are giving you their money and power to do the thing, you know? And like, if that's not, if that's not baked in as part of the DNA of your society, then you're fucked. And so, you know, for me, like, you know, I guess I, I worry more about just getting people to the point where they realize that they can live without having a person with a gun telling them how to live. Um, because there's a lot of people that, that probably first generation won't do so great with that. But, you know, like, until we get to that point, like a lot of the other theory, you know, for me at least, isn't super interesting because we're kind of like postulating on like, well, if all this happened and then everything was perfect exactly as I see it, here's how we build this entire theory and worldview. And it's like, you know, again, until we get a chance to actually evaluate it, it is mostly theoretical. And, and you know, I think it's good to, you know, kind of just keep an open mind of like, we'll try, I mean, like maybe capitalism is the best. I don't know, maybe communism is. It nobody fucking knows, you know, and like, we'll find out and then that's what I'll go with. So, so kind of just right. for people that don't know, can you give a very brief introduction to what mutualism is? Um, as I see it, it's sort of uh, a form of, you know, 
structuring a, a society so that everyone has opportunity and agency and ownership um, without giving too much power and control to any single group or individual. So, um, you know, things are, you know, at least the way that I would structure it is, you know, everything is held communally. Um, things are allocated on an as needed, as wanted basis, depending upon, you know, their scarcity of goods. Um, there is a market. Um, I mean, like, there'll probably be, you know, like in my ideal society, there would be a lot of people doing work that brings them value, like artisans and, you know, whatever. Um, maybe those people barter, maybe there's money, you know, like that again is, not really super important to it, but it's effectively that, um, you know, the the community in and of itself is basically structured to try to assist one another in living, you know, meaningful and productive lives, um, working together and, you know, trying to minimize those conflicts that happen when, you know, basically one person gets overly powerful. So was your experience in the military in any way, um, a motivation to start looking into these other views of anarchism, liberty, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, when I got back, I mean, uh, after, um, you know, I really didn't like the way that Bush prosecuted the war in Iraq. Um, but, you know, again, mostly from like someone who went there and watched us you know, lose it in real time. Um, and so I actually voted for Obama in 2008. And I started to kind of you know, I, I kind of came out of drinking the, the Republican Kool-Aid as much as I had been, where, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, we're the party that's going to give people, you know, opportunity. It's, we're pro-small business and pro-small government. Um, and I started to see the cracks in that. And so that kind of led me to, you know, like, well, what else is out there? So I became, you know, like quasi-libertarian, maybe. Um, still registered Republican until 2015. Um, but I, um, I voted for Gary Johnson in 2012. Um, I was kind of, you know, like not super interested in the libertarian party more than just like, I don't like, you know, people who come and tell me that I can't smoke marijuana in my house. Um, I want people to have fully automatic weapons at their gay weddings. Um, the Republicans really aren't fitting those things. And so the, the libertarians were kind of a place where I could, you know, be in a group where other people were a bit more like-minded, but I didn't really, and I still don't really see a whole lot of point in actually having a libertarian party because this system is designed to crush out anything like that so you're basically just like standing outside of a steel door pounding on it with a couple wooden sticks and you're like this is gonna work eventually it's it's not so um so that you know was kind of like my you know like oh it'd be nice if we could do that but you know we're stuck in this duopoly and so i'll just keep voting republican because they're the least shitty people and then donald trump came along and i was like okay now this is the shittiest person and also hillary clinton is a piece of garbage so what else is out there um and that's when i really started um like i went really quickly because like when i was younger you like you know like noam chomsky i was like noam chomsky he's a terrible communist you know like i had that line that had been told to me that he's a bad guy you shouldn't listen to him and then i read chomsky and i was like holy shit like manufacturing consent fucking changed my view on like everything about news media um you know and like i feel stupid because like looking back like all those things were like he didn't really say anything that was terrifically insightful it was just like these are things that people are just conditioned not to see and if you were thinking about it you probably would see them um, and so that kind of led me down the path of like, well, what other things have I been wrong about? So, um, you know, I started reading, you know, I read Marx, I read a bunch of other, you know, like philosophical texts, I read, I read a lot of um, kind of like political adjacent stuff just to kind of like evaluate like, you know, well, I've always had this hard and fast opinion about this thing I've never read or done or tried. So what should take a look at it? Um, and then like pretty rapidly, um, as I started to learn more, you know, I, I uh, you know, can't, I, I I dropped out of my Republican registration, which I'd been, I mean, like, I fucking volunteered for the McCain campaign. I've been, you know, a rich Republican since, like, 2000. So, you know, like, my entire adult life, left there, um, became a Libertarian, um, actually left the Libertarian Party soon after, just because in my state, registering as a Libertarian means that I can only vote in the Libertarian primary, not in the Democratic or Republican one. So I was like, well, fuck it. It doesn't matter. I'll get out of there. Um, and then I pretty quickly turned towards, um, I don't, I don't really think I had like an idea as to like what kind of anarchy I was looking at, but like, I just came to the realization that like, as long as we're allowing, you know, these organizations to make decisions for people. And when those people say, I don't like what's happening and they have no agency to change it until that fundamental part of our society changes, like none of the other stuff is going to work. You know, like you're basically reforming a system of slavery in, in a lot of ways. And, and, you know, I, I don't want to like make like 
light of actual, you know, like human slavery that happened in America. But like, in a lot of ways, that is a similar system because it, it strips away your agency. It makes you work, you know, you basically work your entire life and you die with no money or debt and your entire life is spent paying the bills that you paid so you can go to work yesterday. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not a system that I think is anywhere near as efficient or good for just usual people's well-being. Um, and we could have a much higher and better standard of living if we just didn't do those things. Um, so that's where I kind of just started from is like, well, if, you know, if we could find a way to get people to not murder each other for, you know, smoking a joint or like, you know, basically telling people how to live their lives and telling you, you can't get an abortion, you can't own a gun, whatever, you know, until that mentality goes away, you know, we're not going to have a good time. Yeah. I had a conversation with a friend of mine today and he's more concerned, much more conservative than I am. And I always say to him, he's like, Oh, so what should we do instead of the police? I basically was saying well, people have a reason for doing these violent crimes. How about we try to solve the reasons as opposed to the results? Yeah. And I mean, even if you're not a bleeding heart, like it's just, you know, if you find out that like the, all the kids in your town have cancer because there is a giant like vat of hexavalent chromium in the middle of your, of your school, you don't just say, okay, well, we'll just keep doing chemo. You're like, maybe we should get rid of that giant vat of toxic in the middle of our, in the middle of our shit. And, you know, for some reason, like, because I, I think in a lot of ways, because like most people that I know that are conservative, they have sort of a bent towards, you know, like rugged individualism of like, you know, we all got to, you know, stick up and do our own thing and be personally responsible. And like, I agree with that to a point, but like, also like, what is the point of actually having a country if we're not going to help those of us who, who need help? You know, like if I am an American and I'm supposed to have affinity for other Americans and I should care about their well being, I should want to help them. And if I see them, you know, like needing food or shelter or education or healthcare, or like kind of the basic necessities, I think that we should try to make that happen, you know, like, and we could do that if we weren't also paying for bankers and sociopaths to send our kids off to fight and die for lies and blow everyone up in the world. I think uh, like the duopoly, the, the biggest problem with them is the Republicans are too individualistic and the Democrats are probably too collectivistic. There, there, there's a middle ground that we need to have where the individuals care. Well, I don't think either one is right. You know, that's the thing is like, in some issues, being an individualist is the right move, I think. In some cases, being a collectivist is the right move. And, you know, if you can't make those kind of, like, I can have feet in both worlds. I can say, like, I don't like the idea of, of private property for the most part. Like, I think personal property is fine. Being able to, like, some sort of, like, you know, Georgism of having, like, some sort of, you know, affinity for, like, if you're using the thing and you have some agency and, you know, like, making the thing better and, and doing something productive for yourself or for others, you can have it. But, like, you know, that's you know, just kind of like. For the viewers that are listening, can you give the distinction between a uh, personal and private property? Yeah. So um, private property is where like, you know, I can own a business or I can own, um, you know, generally like the kind of things that I would like to see owned collectively are things like, you know, workplaces in particular. Like, you know, I don't think it should be like the whole community owns the workplace. I think like, you know, if you're a carpenter and you're in the carpenter's union, the carpenter's union should make decisions about how that business is delivered. And then if, you know, if I, as a consumer, I'm like, I don't like the way these carpenters work, I'll hire another one, you know? So like, I think that, um, you know, kind of the structuring of the means of production in the hands of the people who are doing the work um, is like the primary goal. And then how's that different than um, personal property? So personal property is like your toothbrush, you know, like things that you use that are, you know, like, um, hey, you know, my toilet is my personal property, uh, the food in my house is stuff I cook. Um, you know, I think a lot of that kind of like is transient. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, like, like you don't own a car, like maybe you rent a car and like there's a ride share service and a robot comes and picks you up and then drives you somewhere because, you know, if you're not founding a huge part of your economy around, you know, having everyone have a private property, you know, like they have to own a car, you don't have access to a car if you make that, you know, a service that the community provides, you can probably do a better job for less money and give everyone a better quality of life by doing that. So watching what's happening around the, the country right now with the, the riots, the protests, and um, what is it, Chad? I think it's called, a uh, Chad. Chad. What are your views? 
I just just a curiosity. It's like why, why why is it like when you're when you're picking the the first word to describe what's going on in the country, you start with riots. I. <laughs> it's what uh, I'm arguing actually very much with people about. Okay. Uh, no, I'm, just, I'm just curious about stuff. Like I, I try to pick up on stuff like that. With like, like, oh, how do you contextualize that? Um, but uh, yeah, so I think you know, um, first off, Black Lives Matter was defund the police. You know, like I agree with that 100%. Um, I think that if you look at um, just like I almost became a police officer actually when I got out of the army. Um, I was uh, like when I was in high school, I was working as an electrician, and then when I got in the army and got out, I was like, well, you know, like I'm actually you know pretty good at stuff like this. I think I could be good in my community. Um, so, you know, I took the civil service exam. I actually got uh, provisionally brought on to a municipal department in Massachusetts in a small town um, and was doing, uh, I was getting ready to go to the academy. They were going to pay for me to go. Um, and I was just basically going there a couple times a week and doing like a ride along and like, you know, just kind of seeing like, you know, am I a good fit for the department? Do I like the kind of work that's there? You know, is this going to be a good fit, et cetera, because they were about to make a big commitment sending me there. Um, and uh, so the last day that I was there, um, you know, we're doing a, a ride along and doing like, you know, traffic enforcement. And uh, then we got a call that there was a high speed chase going on the highway. Um, you know, our, you know, the car that I was in with the sergeant followed, uh, got involved in the chase. Um, the car crashed in the town that I was in. Uh, they ran off in the woods after the guy and was like, stay in the car, don't, don't move. And of course, me being, you know, person who's not very good at following orders, um, as soon as they were out of um, uh, view, I jumped out and followed them. Um, and then they, they chased them for like, well, maybe less than a quarter mile. Um, you know, it was like maybe two, three minutes of like, you know, sprinting, but you know, like, you know, the guy wasn't super fast. And then he gets like in the middle of a clearing and like, he, I, I remember cause it was like, you know, probably about like five thirty or six o'clock in the afternoon in the autumn. Um, and so it was like just starting to get dark, but it wasn't like, you know, like, you know, blackout yet. Um, and there was a state police helicopter above us that was uh, shining a light down. Um, and it's funny cause I actually saw something similar happen that was on camera and it caused a lot of problems. But uh, what happened is, is that the guy got to the middle of the clearing, he turned around, he put his hands up, and he's like, he's like, all right, fuck it, I give up. And he's like, I surrender. And the state cop that was in the lead was running towards the guy and didn't even stop. We just fucking speared him in the chest and kneed him in the balls at the same time. Dude falls to the ground, and they just, like, these six cops just got on top of him. And for, like, a good minute and a half, they just kicked the fucking life out of this dude. And it was like... Um, and I mean, like, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been in like a real fight or like seen a real beating, but like a minute and a half of sustained, like shod boot beating, it, it, it's a significant amount of trauma for the human body to endure. Um, and I was like, holy shit, I just witnessed a crime. And so when I got back to the, this is a, a theme in my life of like, maybe the system is good. Um, I got back and uh, my, I had a, the reason I was at the department, it was like an hour and a half away from my house, but it was a friend of mine, you know, was there. Um, and I saw him and I was like, dude, I'm like, I, I need to like file an IA report or something. Like I just witnessed like these six cops fucking assault this dude and like I expected him to be like, holy shit, let's go, let's go do it. And he was like, oh yeah, that guy ran. He's like, he's fucking deserve it. And I was like, I was like, they, they was like, the guy gave up and they, they, they fucking, they beat this dude hard. And he's like, yeah, they'll kick the shit out of that dude. You know, they'll probably kick his ass out of jail too. And I was like, wow. I'm like, so, so this is like how this, like, this is how this works. And he was like, yeah, that's, that's the job, man. And I was like, okay, cool. And then that day I was just like, I'm, I can't do this. I'm fucking quit. You know, but I'm glad I did because now I'm in computers and I can sell more money and I don't have to deal with fucking drunken people and, you know, white beaters and shit. So I think that worked. But, uh, you know, like it, 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 you know, it didn't quite shake my faith in the idea that like America was good, you know, like they still be a conservative and cops would be okay. But like um, now that like it's coming to light and like people are like, Oh no, the police don't do that. Like, yes, they do. Like, the police are designed to fucking use violence against you and make you comply. Like, that is their job. Like, this is not a defect of the system. This is a conscious effort is made to select and encourage that kind of behavior. It's and not a bug; it's a feature. Yeah, it, it's it's a culture of violence and and just supremacy. Like, I won't say white supremacy necessarily, but definitely cop supremacy. And a lot of cops happen to be white. So, you know, when you got a lot of white people that are being supremacist, you're going to get white supremacy. So, you know, to, to make, and, and the thing is, like, that doesn't bother me as a white guy. Like, it's not my fault that there are some shitty white people, but, like, it would be my fault if I was like, no, that doesn't happen. Shut up, black people. All lives matter. You know, like, you know, you either have to acknowledge it, and then I'm like, I don't have any guilt because I want to destroy that. Or you can be the guy who's like, 
no, I want to deny that it exists so much that I'm going to help sustain it. And like, okay, well, now you're helping. Like, you might not be a white supremacist, but you're helping white supremacy to win. So, you know, you should be careful about that. In that case, you are uh, guilty by association if you want to fight to. Not even it. It's just, you know, it, it, you know, like, I know that a lot of people don't have, like, the critical thinking and, like, our whole system and culture is built around, like, giving them this whole narrative, this whole postmodernist view of the world that, like, you know, this has to happen and this is just the way it is. But like, you know, like at a, at a certain point, you just, you know, you have to just be a human and be like, is this right or not? And, you know, a lot of people just don't. Do you think if you became a cop, you'd have a different view right now? Probably, yeah. Um, like I, I was definitely like, I had a very, when I came back from the rock, I had just like, I didn't like hate Arabs, but I just, I was just like, everyone I saw in Iraq was a piece of garbage, you know, like, because that was my job. So if I was a police officer, like the reason why, like a lot of cops profile black kids and like go after them is because the system criminalizes things that black kids have to do to survive in the system. And then they see a lot of black kids doing what they need to do to survive in the system. And then a, a guy comes with a gun and they're like, okay, well, if you're going to bring a gun, I'm going to bring a fucking back 10, you know, like that's why that happens. But like, I think, you know, a lot of times, like, people go into a job like that thinking that, you know, like, you know, like me, like, I was all roses and sunshine going out to base training, like, I'm going to serve my country and protect the Constitution, and then, you know, you get there and you see it, and when you're, when you're in it and you're stuck there, you kind of, like, you know, I won't say it's a cowardice, but it's definitely the easier way to go to just roll with the punches and be like, okay, I guess I'll just do this now and be part of that, you know, kind of culture, so... You know, I could definitely see myself getting washed away in that again and just being a cop today. Like, yeah, fuck these protesters, you know, like they want to shoot white cops, you know, and just being basically a Klansman who doesn't realize he's a Klansman. Like, that could have happened to me. Um, I'm very glad that it didn't, but, you know, it definitely, you know, it could have been in the cards for me. I, yeah, it's something like uh, I was actually discussing the other day uh, on Facebook, and I, I think people are institutionalized into that system and we need to find a way to help get people out of that system because I, but that's people, why we can, you know, like if, if we can start, like, I think defund the police, like for me as someone who's an anarchist slash libertarian, like, I don't know why libertarians aren't fucking all over this. Like, Holy shit. Let's shrink yeah. a big, huge part of government and replace it with services that we could be privatizing and yes. make it actually more efficient. Like, that's a no-brainer, but for some reason, people are still hung up. Like, oh no, we gotta, we gotta have cops. Like, I mean, you don't. You, you simply don't need to have the police as they exist in this country, you know. And people like they refuse to acknowledge that. And if if they're not gonna, I mean, like you know, there there's a lot of good cops. You know, it's not an all bad system. But I mean, like we have a system that like like kills like 420 something black people every year for mostly things that aren't real crime. You know, like oh, he had a gun. Yeah, because you're coming at him with a gun. Like, you know, like it's a self-defense thing. You know, like if you criminalize someone's behavior and the only way they can earn an income, then they become a criminal. Like, if you're going to be a criminal, you might as well be a criminal who's safe and have an illegal gun so you can protect yourself. So, you know, it's like that whole, I don't know, it's just a very big self-sustaining thing. And people, until they realize that and are like, my support for you know, like the good cops or whatever, is actually enabling the bad cops and the people who are really bad at the cop who are using the cops to control me are controlling me. Like until you can kind of realize that and move past it, it's like, you know, there's, there's not like that. That's the fundamental thing that you have to understand before you can really start making like actual, you know, decisions with agency and information and reality. So out of this conversation, if you could sum up in two to three minutes, what you wish people to take away from it, the most important, what would you say? Um, I would say um, to not, to always think that you might be wrong about things that, that cause harm. So if you, if you believe something and you see someone who says, I don't like that, that's hurting me, just have the decency to, to hear them out and consider it. Maybe they're full of shit. Or maybe you just haven't realized what's happening because um, it's very easy to overlook things like that when it's not actually directly affecting you. Um, and it's a form of kindness that's entirely absent in our modern society. And I think it would solve a lot of problems if we could do that because until we can be kind to 
other people and, and care about the well-being of everyone in our community it's very hard to care about and like you know love yourself in a real way because like if everyone's a piece of garbage then you know why am i unique so um until we have you know a more positive outlook on that and we actually you know take the responsibility to take care of other people around us um that we will continue to live in a third world shithole with iphones okay so what are three to five sources whether books articles movies that you would you think people should look into that would help them get to like your viewpoint or that would at least change make them think okay um well uh I would say for Potkin, if we could combine the two into one, uh, the bread book and mutual aid, I think are very important to kind of show, you know, again, that making things communal doesn't mean making them worse. You know, like in a lot of cases, you can socialize some things and get better results out of them for less money and effort. And if that works, then you should do that. Um, and so there's some good examples in there of some things that work both ways. Um, on the individual side, I'd say uh, the ego in its own um, is a very hard book like i actually had to restart it like three times because like as i was reading through it i was like oh wait a second i have a bunch of things that i'm doing that are like that and kind of had to like go back and and redo it and it took me like like almost a year to actually read the thing um but it's definitely very uh helpful um and then uh i would say i don't know i, I would i would call the last one a toss-up between uh foucault and chomsky uh, let me take your pick there. I mean, either you want to learn about the way the people in power are fucking you, or you want to learn about how the people in power are fucking you with media. Okay. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, this was a great interview. And do you have any last words? Uh, yeah, I guess just uh, be kind, take drugs, and buy guns. Thank you. All right. See you, man. See you, man. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.